tonight for what he's doing amongst us. Let's stand our feet and go into worship. I'm thankful for what he's doing in our lives as a church family. Let's just celebrate tonight together. on my behalf and in the moments when I can't defend myself he is my defender he's my helpmate come on how many of you are thankful for that tonight in this place We're thankful for his goodness thankful for his love tonight come on just worship him tonight Brought that to us. Yes, you did. 
Come on, sing that with me tonight. Oh, victory, you have won. Just remember a time whenever he came to your rescue, right when you needed him, right in the moment that you needed him in the midst of a situation, he came through. Right now, just lift up a heart of gratitude and just in your own way, in your own heart, just begin to tell him, thank you, Lord. Just begin to thank him. Lift up a heart of praise and gratitude for who he is. We bless your name, Lord. Oh, yes, we do. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Father, we just come in this place tonight and we say thank you, Lord. For every single moment, Lord, that you've lifted our heads, you've lifted our hearts, you've moved us into situations and you've moved us out of situations, God. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for everything that you do in our lives. But God, most importantly, God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son who came and died and championed for us. When we could not get to you, you came to us. So we thank you tonight, God, and we bless your name, and we honor you in this place. Sing this out with me tonight, church. Our champion, you fight for us. You made a way where there was none. Our champion, you're strong. You're strong in us. The dead we owe. The dead we
find two or three people around you this evening and let them know how glad you are to be in the house of the Lord worshiping with them tonight. Good evening, everybody. I said, good evening, everybody. Good evening. There we go. It's Wednesday night. It's the last day of July. Should I remind us? It's still summer, though. 90-some degrees today. The Lord is faithful, isn't he? Seasons come and seasons go. Um, thank you all for your prayers, your concern, your... Uh, you're reaching out to us in time, uh, the time when Lisa's mom had passed away. We had the funeral today, and um, so we're trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. And but the boy, the church was just a, an incredible group of people. You all just reaching out like you did. Those of you that attended some of the the viewing and the, the funeral today, and the food that you brought in for the family, the bereavement dinner. Thank you for all your hospitality, your love and support. I just uh, can't thank you enough. So we. Keep moving, right? Life just moves forward. It just does. We're going to receive our tithe and offering tonight. Steph is going to bring the, the message this evening, and I think you're going to be in for a, if you've heard her before, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, well, you, you'll be in for a great treat of revelation and, and the way she communicates the, the word is applicable to our lives, too. But let's go ahead and do this. i got a couple things I want to tell you, and then uh, let's receive our tithe and offering. Many people give midweek. Huh? Up midweek, and uh, people bring their tithe and offering for, um, it's not here on Sunday, you can do it on Wednesday evening, of course. There's two ways of giving, um, two primary ways of giving. You can give through offering envelopes that are underneath your seats. Grab one of those, make your checks out to ECH or Expression Church. <clears throat> if it's cash, you can stick in your envelope and put your name on it so we can keep track for your contribution report that comes out to you at the end of the year. And the other way would be the, there, on the screens, it's the text giving, and uh, it's become very popular. 84321 is the text giving number. You just type that into the, the, the sender who you're sending it to, 84321, and all you gotta do is put in the amount that you're going to give, and if you've uh, put in your information before, it'll, it'll come back up, and that's all you have to do. It'll send you a receipt automatically. But if you haven't, then it'll um, ask you, to prompt you to put your, your information in. It's very safe, very secure. And once you've done that once, unless you're going to change your bank um, a, a card or bank account to, to whatever we have on file, you only have to do that one time. So 84321 or offering envelopes that we're going to receive uh, manually here in just a moment. Um, before I pray, though, let me tell you just a couple of things that are happening. Or one thing I know is happening for sure is the uh, we're doing the back to school um, partnership with Lovejoy Ministries out of Fort Gay. Um, they're... Um, compiling a list. There is a, a list out at the, the ministry table. If you want to grab a hold of that list, it'll tell you all the things that they're in need of. For kids that are going back to school, they're filling up some backpacks. Uh, there's just an entire list there. You don't have to buy everything on the list, just whatever you feel like picking up. If you're out uh, Walmart or wherever you get your supplies or see school supplies, they're just about everywhere right now because school's starting back in a couple of weeks here in Cabell County. And in Wayne County, it starts back, I think, in three weeks. So uh, things are happening, moving fast. It'll be fall before you know it. I'm looking forward uh, to the last, sum the last little bit of summer. Still have lots of people on vacation, but I'm looking forward to fall because we're going to, uh, you'll hear about more about this over the next two or three weeks. We're going to launch a lot of things come September, after, right after Labor Day. So uh, we've got a trip of Africa that's going on too right after Labor uh, of. Labor Day, that they leave right, really right after that, the week after. So we'll keep you informed of all the things that are happening. There's going to be a lot of things that are happening in ministry for the kids and the youth. So they just came back from a, on Monday evening, came back from a trip to Ace uh, Adventure, I think it's called, in, in, um, on the other side of Charleston by Beckley area. And there was 30, how many? 31 people that went on that trip came back and they were just, it was just an incredible time. So if you ever get an opportunity to have your kids go on those uh, trips like that with the youth, it's a great bonding time, connection or relationship. So uh, I would encourage you to have your kids be a part of that as well. 
So with the school supply stuff going on, the kids and the ministry, we've got some big announcements we're going to be naked, making sometime probably the end of this month on some uh, uh, opportunities that the church has been afforded on some property that's around here. Uh, we'll be keeping you involved in all of that. So lots of growth that's happening, lots of expansion. Um, but uh, more importantly, it's the most important thing we want to do is make sure we get stay connected to each other in relationship. So you'll hear more about that as we go forward. So are you ready to give tonight? Are you sure? Undecided ones? In India, what they do when, uh, when you're in India, I've been there three times, one of the biggest challenges I had to face is when you ask them for directions, is this the place you're going? Is, is this the post office? They don't say yes, and they don't say no. They, they do this, they waggle, right? So you're going, is that a yes or is that a no? It depends on who you ask. That's the whole thing in India. So you, and the whole rule of thumb is, when you go there and you ask for directions somewhere, you have to get three people in a row that give you the exact same directions or you probably don't have the right ones because they, they're indecisive, right? We're not gonna be indecisive in our giving tonight. Are you ready to give? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this, this privilege that you've allowed us to assemble together in a body as a group of believers, as a company of believers that come together, Lord, with common vision, common interests, knowing, God, that you're the centerpiece of all of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can bring our tithe and offering into this storehouse here, that there might be meat for us to be able to, to grow and to prosper in our lives and to be, able to, 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 to be able to connect to one another, but also, Lord, be able to grow in you. So, Father, tonight, as we bring our tithe, our offering, whatever we might have, whatever the Lord, you lay up on our, our hearts to bring, I just uh, ask that you bless those people, Lord, that are giving. Bless those, Lord, that are even considering their financial ways of life, the economics that they live, so they, they will tap into your economics, which is a much greater and bigger way of living as opposed to just what it is in the earth today. So, Father, help us and teach us in our, our, our discovery of you and the way you want us to live in our finances. And we bless those that are night that are giving in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Um, one thing I want to mention to you as well while you're giving is the, as we approach I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. As we approach fall, we're going to discover and begin to teach and preach on Sundays and some on Wednesdays. We're going to begin to preach um, on, on worship a little more. And not just in worship and song, even though that'll be a big part of it, but we're going to teach on worship and what the Lord is meaning. When, when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, right before he brought them over, he said, Moses, I want you to take the children, tell them that they're coming to follow you. I want you to tell Pharaoh to let him go, and I want him to go three-day journey and worship me. And what worship meant wasn't just the song, and even though it was a song, even wasn't just musical instruments, even though it was musical instruments, it was entertaining his presence. Bring, bring them to a place in three days up on a mountain where I come in the midst of them, and they begin to learn me and encounter me, and then I can encounter them. So we remove the mystery of the way they think I am, and I'm gonna show them plainly who I am. We're gonna talk about that in the fall. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that because how you relate to God and your view of God directly impacts your relationships with people. Whether you realize it or not, it shows, right? So we're gonna talk about that. So what we've been doing in the last several weeks is we, we, we always have you stand during worship, right? We stand up and many of you trickle down after about two or three songs, depending on how long the worship goes. You sit back down. But we wanna give honor to the word as well. And I wanna give honor to Steph tonight because Steph's gonna bring the word, right? And she's a gift that's in this house. Would you stand to your feet? And I want to, as we bring her up, I want to give honor not only to the songs that we sing we worship, but give honor to the word of God. Father, in Jesus' name, as Steph comes, I'm asking you to anoint her, her delivery, her revelation, and even as she's even speaking, speak to her and let her see things she's never seen before and then communicate them all to us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Amen. You all may be seated. I'm excited about summertime, but I'm very excited about fall. Um, like Pastor Kevin was saying, I have been a worship leader for a majority of my life. And I've, I, in some form or fashion, I've sung and led people in song and then led people in worship for 
once again, a majority of who I am. And this year specifically, God has completely flipped me upside down to what I understand of a lot of different areas. Uh, worship being one of them. And it's not, like he was saying, it's not about songs. It's not about uh, a style of music or the fact that I, you know, we can get up here and sing and if we hit the drum cymbals just right or if we hit something, that it will give you goosebumps and that's worship. And I know, unfortunately, in, in my immature days that there for a while I thought that was what it was and the Lord began to show me in a deeper way. That's not it at all. He can work in those ways. There's nothing wrong with that. We have those moments. But he's completely turned me upside down in my understanding of things. And I've heard it said, and I've said it before, <clears throat> that God will never contradict his word, but he constantly contradicts our understanding of it. And the way that we view things and the way that we filter things and understand things. About three weeks ago, uh, Pastor Kevin, may, many of you were here, and tonight uh, comes a lot from what I experienced that three weeks ago. He spoke a message, and let me know if you all remember this. It was when he began to just read the scripture, and he began to tell about how just falling in love with the word of God, and instead of reading it to get something and to try to, well, you know, you've got to minister, or you've got to do this, or you've got to do that, you begin to read the word of God when you get in a bind and you get in a pinch. You begin to read the word of God just for a deeper revelation of who he is. And when he said that, it felt like a, just a blanket. And I, the only word I could think of at the moment, because I was sitting right there, and he began to pray and prophesy, and the only thing that I could think of was a mantle. And I know that we've heard that, and you know, it's kind of an anointing going from one to the other, but it's still a weight that I felt fall on me sitting right there. And all I could do as he began to prophesy and he began to pray is I felt myself I had to get on the floor. And I just began to feel the presence and the weight of God. And honestly, it took me by surprise because I've been in those kind of postures before. And I asked God in those moments, what is it that you're wanting me to experience in this moment? Because here I am on my knees feeling the weight in this mantle. And he spoke to me so tenderly. He said, I need you to have a passion for my word, but I also need you to understand the potency of prayer. And I want you to carry a mandate over the next six months for this house on the potency and the power and the presence of prayer. Now, I'll be honest with you. It's one of those things just like worship. Singing, worship music, I feel like I can do that, absolutely. I can, I can feel my way around that, and we can, we can come in here, and I know that what God has anointed this house and our people with, that we can get up and we can begin to just worship the Lord. The presence of God will be here. People will be blessed. I have confidence in that. And I have confidence in our prayers, and I have confidence in that. Like I've watched it, especially on like expression care and uh, even for comfort and all those different areas. But I do believe that in my life, what God has called in my heart right now is to have a deeper understanding and a deeper revelation of my prayer life being a little bit different than what I've always used it as. Because how many of you all in this place tonight that it's okay, it's completely, I'm not indicting the way that we pray, but many times the, the synonymous word with prayer is request. We're always asking for something. We're asking, you know, we pray when we get in a jam. We pray when we see the blue lights in the rear view mirror, amen? Not that I've seen them lately. Let's just clear that up, I've not seen them. But we pray whenever you open up your online banking. <laughs> Please be there. Please, <laughs> no. But here's the thing, is I found myself almost being a little bit self-centered in the last probably year and a half because I've been praying, I need this. Okay, we need to pray about this. And even though I pray for others, there is a deeper place that I feel in my spirit that God is wanting to bring us into to where our prayers availeth much, that we begin to see things happen, but it's from a different perspective. So tonight, what I wanna do very quickly, and we've done, Pastor Kevin has done this before many times, but any time that the, the Lord just begins to speak to me, he brings into remembrance a couple things. We're going to be in Scripture tonight in a few different places. 
But tonight, my entire purpose and my goal this evening is that our prayer life begins to deepen and that we get a deeper understanding and revelation of what our prayer life truly is and what it's for in a day-to-day thing. Now, I'm not talking about anything weird or goofy, but as we get through it, I'll show you what I'm talking about. The first scripture that we're going to be in tonight is in Leviticus chapter 3. And what I want to tell you tonight is God is a God of order. We just talked about how Moses, whenever he was leading the children of Israel, he, ta- he is a God that gives specific instruction in a lot of different areas. He said, I want you to take the children apart and I want you to have them worship and I want them to understand who I am and my character before we begin to lead into different places because if they don't understand my character and how I'm leading them, they won't understand my heart. So what he also does, every single time that the, that the Lord gives a specific instruction, it's a reason and it's for a purpose. And so one of the things that we always kind of go back to, and I want to encourage you, if you've never had the opportunity to get to go through a tabernacle study of what the tabernacle symbolized, because it seems to me that every single, he did it early on, but then all throughout scripture, you begin to see him talk and symbolize that tabernacle experience. And before we go to that scripture, go ahead and put up that picture that I sent today, Rocky. So the tabernacle was the first place where, honestly, he gave specific instructions. And this is a picture. We've talked about this many times, and Pastor Kevin has done this. And you, you had this tent dwelling, and this tent was mobile, because how many of you all know the presence of God is everywhere? And there's many times that he'll have you in one area, and then suddenly he says, I need you to go to this area. You've got to be able to be in his presence on the move. Amen? So, This is a picture of the tabernacle. You had walls, it was a tent. And then you can see all the way here to to your right, it's the gate. And then right there, that big yellow box is something called the brazen altar. Now this all, this, this portion here is the outer court. We've talked, Pastor Kevin has talked about this a lot. You have the outer court. You've got the brass laver, which is that blue dot there. And it's basically where, that is where many of the people and the priest, whenever in the old covenant, when people once a year would bring their sacrifices to the gate, they would come and they would meet the priest at the brazen altar. And at the brazen altar was where sacrifices were made. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. And then the outer court and the laver, this was a place that was seen and that was just all around. Everybody could see what was happening all around what was going on at that brazen altar and the brass laver. So that's the outer court. That's something that can be seen. He gave specific instructions for that brazen altar. Let's go ahead and go in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 3, verse 1. And it says of this, and if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, this is talking about the, bra- the brazen altar, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I spent most of my life thinking that the priest killed the animal. That's not what happened. The person that raised that animal and brought that animal before was the one that had to kill this animal, not the priest. I believe that that was a type and shadow because here's the thing. I don't know about you. I don't know that I'd had it in me to kill a lamb. That would, especially, this was not just some animal that you just saw roaming out in the... This had to be a perfect spotless lamb that had lived with this family, had grown up with the kids, possibly became, had a name, you don't know. This person had to, what had happened at that brazen altar was this person would then come up with this lamb, spotless, sweet, innocent, and it wasn't like he could just, there you go, see you next year. That's not what happened. He would bring that lamb, he would come to the priest, and then he would take his head and he would put it on the head of that lamb as a symbolization of transferring his sin to this spotless lamb for his whole family. And then he himself had to take the life of this lamb. Let me encourage you tonight that just because somebody else took our place doesn't mean it shouldn't still break your heart 
does not mean that it shouldn't still touch you because our place, our Jesus, the almighty Christ came and absolutely took our place, but it still should be a hurt deep inside that he had to go through such because what he, what God wanted his people to see was that freedom is not free. It costs something. It broke the heart of a father, but this person would have to slay this animal and then put it up on the brazen altar. Now let's read in Leviticus a little bit more. Verse two, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar, which is a burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. What does this mean whenever I'm even talking about prayer? The Lord has brought us all before. I'm thankful that he took my place, amen? I'm thankful that he took my sins, he took all that. But here's the thing, I know in my own personal life, I love the Lord. I love his mercy, I love his grace, I love who he is in my life. And this is such a great symbolization of how he can take sin, he placed it on himself, and he he became the atonement for us. But let me tell you something that God began to just deposit into my heart about my prayer life. And it's very simply this, that I don't ever want to negate the fact that yes, he is a good God, he is merciful, he is loving, he is all-knowing, but he is also a father, an everlasting father father that is okay with his children feeling some fire at times. Because here's the thing, without any, and this is something that we have, I believe that God's taken us into in this fall, is there is a sovereignty of God. There is a sweetness of God, but then there's also a sovereignty that makes him a good father, that you know what's good for your kids, You're not gonna let them just do whatever and whenever. It doesn't matter what they want to do. There are times that you have to bring a little bit of correction and love love them into the right way. And sometimes my father and my mother were okay with me feeling a little fire on my behind. They were okay with that because it brought me into a place of remembrance of who I really am. So here's what I wanna do now is that's an old covenant scripture, but I want us to go now, let's go to 1 Peter 4. And it says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't be surprised whenever things get hot. I love, the, I love our Christian walk. I love the fact that he does. He lifts our burdens. He breaks the yoke. He does those things. The anointing does that. But let me tell you, if somebody tries to sell you something in Christianity that says that this is an easy walk, that everything's going to go your way, and that you are never going to have an attitude problem, you're never going to, once that you get saved and you leave it here, then you will never have to deal with your stuff again. Run. Run. That's not true. That's wrong. That's bad doctrine. That's why he, Peter said it this way. Don't think it's strange whenever a fiery trial comes. Because I don't know about you, but fiery trials, those are extreme. The only way that I can get you to understand this and everyone in here to completely understand this is if I were to strike a match and hold your hand over top of it and the flame, and I'm telling you, don't move it. You begin to feel the pain, the burn, the singe to the point that it becomes just a a natural thing to jerk away from it because it hurts so bad. I'm telling you, there are people in this room who have experienced fiery trials and misunderstood that they were, God will not send and he will not put something on somebody for, to teach him a lesson, but I promise you he will use those things to bring you through into a better understanding of his grace and his mercy and his power working in our lives. So don't think that it's strange when suddenly, oh my goodness, and let me tell you something very quickly. 
A fiery trial is not when you get evicted from an apartment. It's not. A fiery trial is not whenever, oops, I, I forgot to do this, and the, uh, now the, I'm just being persecuted because this happened, and I, I'm, I'm being, it's not one of those things. Now, I understand there are situations that come that you can't help, but I'm talking about something that gets you in your core that had nothing to do with you making a good decision or a bad decision, or maybe your financial realm. I'm talking about something where it ripped your heart out to the point that you didn't know what to do, and all you knew to do was cry, and you begin to just call out to God because you didn't know what else to do because the fire was burning so hot and you could not get your hand away from it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in here tonight? I'm not just talking about, I don't have, I don't have gas, I don't have this. I'm not just talking about it, that. Even though those are trials, I'm talking about, you don't understand, my child is sick and has an incurable disease. I lost my best friend. I lost them to cancer before their time. You don't understand something. I lost a child. Those are the things Whenever you try to hold your hand over, you can't do it. Don't be surprised when those things come because I'm telling you, that's the brazen altar. Because in those moments is whenever God is wanting to teach us to pray and to sacrifice. Even though he has already become the great sacrifice, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about tonight a prayer that calls out to God with fire burning because I'm hurt. I, do, I can't do this anymore. The depression, the anxiety, all of this, I've got to lay it down at an altar and it be consumed because I'm ready to kill it myself. That's one of the hardest altars to ever face. And I'll be honest with you, my prayer life struggles in those areas because I got some stuff I don't want to kill. I've got some stuff that it's become a pet to me. <laughs> I've got some bad attitudes. I've got some things that they've kind of become my pets. They're kind of some things that I'm holding on to some victimization here that I was done wrong. And it's not my fault. It's their fault. They're wrong. So it's become my pet. It's become something I'm very familiar with and I'm okay leading around and it being close to me because it brings just a little bit of comfort. But tonight, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart and said, I need you to lay that on that altar. Because on that brazen altar, everything gets consumed. There's a reason that the Bible says it this way. He said, I want you to take the fat and I want you to take the kidneys and the liver out because he knew that was gonna be something that was completely difficult. Fat's an insulator. I know. <laughs> I've been on a quest to lose some of it. But sometimes it can keep us in a place that we're okay with some things. We're okay with that. That's the very first thing that God wants to burn away, are the things that have caused us to be okay to cope to be able to bring into our life to kind of be okay and be all right with. And the kidneys and the liver, those are your filters. They have one purpose, they filter. I am so thankful for an almighty God that loved my heart enough that on a brazen altar when I was six years old, he knew that I had a filter of the world system and the world strategies that I did not need. And he said, I need to remove that first. And aren't you thankful tonight? So many of us still have some of those filters that we see things through of negativity, of just sarcasm, just, just so many different things that we look at the world and you just finally have a conditioned response because that's your filter. I want to encourage you tonight. That's one of the first things that he wants us to bring to the altar is how we filter things, how we look at things, and how we pray that brazen altar, he says it this way. I love it in verse 13. He just said, don't be, a, don't be surprised when the fire comes, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. The bigger the fire, the bigger the glory. Rejoice. Instead of being surprised by some fire, rejoice in it. Because the only way to partake in the sufferings of Christ and to truly partake in his glory and his joy is to let him take you through this suffering process. 
How many of you all know that story about the young men and their mama came, those sons of thunder, but they needed their mama in the New Testament? I just always thought that was funny, two grown men needing their mama to go up to their boss and say, now, he needs a, they both need a promotion. <laughs> Try that today. <laughs> but here's the thing. He said, I need one of them to sit on your right and one of them to sit on your left. And what does Jesus say? He says, they have to be able, he, I'm paraphrasing here, they have to be able to walk with me, not just like that, but in my suffering as well. He would not have put those verses in there if he did not know that we would go through things, that we would have moments where we were weak, whenever everybody else looks at us and thinks we're so strong on the outside and they're even taking and partaking of our fruit, but inside we're struggling and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a bad thing, but all, the only bad thing is whenever you don't run to that altar in those moments and say, God, I'm feeling the fire here and I need you to do what only you can do in this moment and that is burn everything off of me because the brazen altar is simply a place where he deals with your flesh. He deals with every bit of it, and when he does, it's glorious. It has a little bit of suffering, but then it has an amazing return, because I don't want to try to fix me. I've tried. It's ugly. Has anybody else in here ever tried to fix yourself? Oh, it's horrible. I'm telling you, because I know me. <laughs> I know what I'm capable of. It's scary. I know my intents, I know that I can manipulate, I know those things, but here's the beautiful thing, is when he is an everlasting sovereign father that will walk his children through a suffering process at the brazen altar, and he begins to burn away all the things that aren't of him, he knows that he comes out on the other side ready for the next moment. Because here's the thing, I am thankful for those brazen altar moments. I'm thankful that he's forgiven me. He has dealt with my stuff. He's dealt with those things. And we have them on Sunday mornings, on Wednesdays. You'll have these moments where you'll come to the altar and you'll, you'll feel the presence of God and it fills you up and you feel this weight's lifted. Now what? That's one of the greatest things. Go ahead and put that picture back up, Rocky. Because here's the thing that he spoke into my life through prayer. You see there, it has the little brazen altar and the outer court and the laver. Many times that whole thing that's happening here, even though some things are a small thing that many don't see, most of the people can see what's happening because glory, glory, hallelujah, everybody saw when I got saved. Everybody saw when he forgave my sins and took everything away. Everybody knew it because my papa grabbed me up and held me up in his arms and just was happy and walked me all over the church. Everybody knew Steffi got saved. It was a big moment in that outer court. And I visited that altar many times and many people have seen me get free. But here's the next step, and Pastor Kevin's talked about this before. You have that outer court, but then there's something else. There is another altar that happens and it's in that inner court. As you keep walking from the laver, which is that blue dot, you go into that next circle or that next square. It's called the holy place. To the left is the golden candlesticks, and to the right is the table of showbread. We won't go into that. But then right before the veil of the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant sat, there was another altar. And that's the one that God has been dealing with my heart big time about. It's the altar of incense. The altar of incense was a place where the high priest could only go because everybody could see out here Everybody could see in the outer court, but as soon as he went into the holy place, that's when he began to do his priestly duties inside of that holy place. He would take the blood from that lamb that was slain by the family. He would wash himself in the brass laver, and he would begin to see the blood mixed, and that laver was made from the, the gold, the mirrors, and all these different things from the ladies of the Israelites. And as he would begin to wash his hands, and that blood would mingle with the water, he would see him. It changed how he saw himself through the blood. How you see yourself will change after that brazen altar moment because you have given over how you see yourself, just like the ladies did with the Israelites. They gave how they saw themselves so he would wash his hands. And then he would enter into a place that nobody else could go. 
They would tie, many of us already know this, they would tie a rope around his, um, his foot and they would put bells and pomegranates. And what they would do, <laughs> whenever I was growing up, I thought this was hilarious. I thought, and it, this is true, that if he went into these areas and he went into the Holy of Holies with any kind of unconfessed sin or any kind of uh, hidden thing or manipulating motive, he, God would strike him dead. And I was always taught that the bells and the pomegranates, you could hear them until he got there to the, make sure that he was still alive. But for those of you, I'm not gonna spoil that. Listen to one of Pastor Kevin's sermons about the day of Pentecost, what that really means. It's incredible. But here's what happens. Now behind closed doors is that altar of incense. Now let's go into Exodus 37 because this is a different kind of prayer. This is a completely different posture. Exodus 37 Verse 25. And he made the incense altar of shittim wood. The length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of a cubit, it was four square, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were the same. This altar has horns. And he overlaid it with pure gold, both he top of it, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns of it also he made into a crown of gold, round about. And he made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof by the two corners of it upon the two sides thereof to be places for the staves to bear withal. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the apothecary. What this is, again, God gave the instructions. Shittim wood is what we know today as acacia wood. Acacia wood grew in the desert and didn't have to have a whole lot of water, but it was able to be sustained by just enough. It was able to be in the midst of harsh situations. It was still able to flourish. Therefore, it was set apart to build everything that you see in the tabernacle out of acacia wood. I'm thankful that if you've got Jesus, that's all you need. We are that acacia wood. We are that thing that even in the hottest of conditions, those burning moments that if we have him deep inside, we can withstand anything and we are now consecrated just like it was specific that only that wood was to be used. We, it was consecrated. It was set apart just for the use of this. That's what, and it's a type and shadow of who we are in Christ strong, and it was overlaid with gold, his divinity. Oh, I'm thankful tonight that I don't have to look good for anybody on my own. He makes us look amazing. Because of his beauty and who he is, he comes and he mingles with humanity and does amazing things. But here's what happened. At the altar of incense, behind closed doors, this is a different type and a posture of prayer. In this area, it's getting closer to the heart of the Father. And what he would do was he would take a coal from the brazen altar, and he had a censer, and he would bring the incense and put it into the censer from the apothecary. But then he would take the coal from the brazen altar, and he would begin his journey into the holy place. The incense, anytime you saw that, represented prayer. And just because it was incense, it still made it prayer. But there was something different about when fire began to touch it is that the prayer became more potent and it began to rise. And the incense, he would bring the coal into the censer and he would begin to swing it and the smoke would begin to bellow up and it symbolized something that our prayers are ineffective until the fire of God begins to hit it in a way that it will begin to bellow up and the prayers would begin to rise and he would come to that altar of incense and he would begin to bring the prayers and they would begin to rise. Let me show you because this shows up again later on in Scripture. Go ahead and pull up Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Oh, this is good. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of, a, of half an hour. 
And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, there it is again, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Let me tell you, right there is the prayers of people that have finally understood what it means to have the fire of God riding on their prayers. Is when it gets cast into the earth, it will move and shake things. Because this is what God has put in my heart for Expression Church over the next few months is that we will begin to take what we have experienced at the brazen altar and we would take our prayers, our prayer life, everything that we are, we would begin to combine them together and then we would begin to see the entire earth begin to shake and quake. Is there anybody else in here that wants that kind of prayer life so that things begin, I'm telling you, I have been praying. This has been my prayer over the last few weeks. I'm okay. I'm, I'm really all right with what God has done in my life. I'm so thankful for it. I'm not negating anything like that. But I want to see more. I want to see him do some things that, I, that completely just baffle my understanding of what I've always thought of him. I want to know what it is for my prayer life to begin to ignite someone else's prayer life to the point that it just becomes a wafting incense that is beautiful and a sweet-smelling savor before the Lord. And I have found that many times in my life that the only way that I can get that kind of prayer life is when he takes me behind behind the curtain and he starts to burn things out of my own heart because he's burned out the things of the flesh, but now he's going to deal with my spirit behind closed doors. And I'm thankful for a God who loves us and will correct us behind closed doors. Because in this place, in that next place, in the holy place, is where he has dealt with your sin nature, he's dealt with your flesh, but inside those doors, he's going to deal with you. He's going to deal with the stuff deep inside, but he's going to do it in a loving way because he does not, he is not a father that will embarrass his children just for fun. I'm thankful today, I never thought I'd say this, that my mama, I was a horrible kid in church. <laughs> I'm telling you. I see our kids run around, and I'm like, they got nothing on me. I, I was an interesting kid. But that was my stage, was the church. That's when I did my best work of disrupting things and deciding to uh, test things and new words and things in church. And I would get in trouble in church all the time, all the time by doing stupid stuff. But my mother and my father always did one thing, and I never thought I'd say this, but I got very familiar with the bathroom at Cedar Cliff Baptist Church and Buffalo Baptist Church. How many of y'all know why? I got very familiar with that bathroom because of one thing. The correction they were about to give me was for me, not for everybody I was going to church with. They were not going to embarrass me in front of people. They weren't going to get me, you wait till I get you out in the parking lot and everybody's going to see this. They loved me enough to make sure that the correction that I needed in those moments was something between me and them that would actually turn me into the person that I needed to be, not to embarrass me and use a moment. And that always hurts whenever, and I, I encourage you parents to make sure that you don't bring shame on your children just for the sake of them feeling something. Encourage them to have correction to a point that it actually helps them to change into that person because that's what God does with us is he takes us behind this curtain to deal with the things that are the closest to his heart. And the altar of incense is him dealing with all the stuff inside of you. That's when he's dealing with your insecurities. That's whenever he's dealing with those moments of nobody cares if I even showed up tomorrow. 
Nobody cares if I dropped off the face of the earth. The things that would embarrass you if everybody heard you say them. That's where he's dealing with those things. But here's the beauty of it. What he does in these moments is once we've had that brazen altar experience where the fire just begins to consume and we get in now and he he deals with those things, what I have found in my life, and now as a minister of the gospel, and I don't say that term as as a minister of the gospel, you all are ministers. We're all ministers of reconciliation. That's our job. That's what we're called to. That's what we're consecrated for. That's what we're set apart to do. But the cool thing about this is there was a priestly duty attached to this. The priestly duty attached to that altar of incense was to begin to collect the prayers of others. And we saw in Revelation, it was to begin to collect the prayers of all the saints. It was to begin to take notice of somebody else's dream. It was to begin to look and see somebody else's hurt. And it, was, it wasn't so much about me anymore. I got my own issues. I got my own stuff. But how many of you all know some of the greatest moments that God deals with you is when you start caring and working with other people. And you start bearing one another's burdens. And you start serving others' dreams just like they're your own. I get a bigger kick out of somebody today. I'm going to tell this because he's not in here. Okay, Michael Rousey today. Incredible drummer, phenomenal, absolutely amazing, has played in arenas, has played everywhere, and can just tear the house down. I asked him today, even in the midst of a a, a really hard situation at this funeral, which was still such a sweet moment, I needed someone to play guitar with me. He himself will say, I'm not a guitar player. I've only been playing for just a little, I know three chords. I'm like, you can do this. You can do, absolutely you can do this. I'm gonna give you what you need. He comes into that funeral home with that guitar on and he plays his hands trembling, shaking and he plays and he does amazing. And he conquered a fear because it was something he wanted to get better at. He wants to do. That gave me so much joy to see him conquer something because of what my priestly duty is. And his priestly duty and your priestly duty is to now begin to collect the prayers and the dreams and the aspirations of others and begin to offer them and bring the fire of God on with them and offer them up at the altar of incense as a sweet-smelling savor. This isn't about just me and you. I want to encourage you, the greatest trick of the enemy is to get your mind on yourself all the time. The greatest trick of the enemy is to get you to sing that song, I was always on my mind. And he will, because if he can keep you, now here's here's the crazy thing. He's okay with your brazen altar experience. He couldn't stop that. He actually aided and helped it. But if he can keep you out of that holy place where God's got you all to himself, then he's won half the battle. Because many times he will keep us in isolation when it's all about us. And that is where prayer is so important. That's where prayer can shake, just like we saw in Revelation, where prayer begins to shake the foundations of things. Because there are families, there are homes, there are relationships that need to be cemented on a foundation. Amen? There are situations that I need to pray about in my own personal life that need to be shaken at their core and in your personal life that need to be shaken. And the only way to do and to enter into that holy place and to begin to collect those moments is in prayer. Now, we are a spirit-filled church, and I'm thankful for that because I know in my own life, the Lord's been convicted me so much about we, we believe in praying in the Spirit. We believe that that is a thing that is for God's people. And I want to encourage you, if you, do not, if you don't know what that is, we want to be able to walk in that journey with you. But he's been convicting me and saying, I need you to spend time 
in that. I need you to begin to exercise that muscle again because there's moments that you need to be doing this even whenever you're not in a jam. You need to be doing this even whenever you're not needing something because this moment in the altar of incense is not about what I need. It's about what am I supposed to be in the body of Christ? What is it that the world needs? What is it that your family needs? What is it that God has placed me as a priest and you, and we've been called as a royal priesthood to begin to bring the fire of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and we begin to put it with prayer and it begins to supersede anything that we know. It begins to bypass our mind, our brain, our common sense. It begins to just completely bypass that and we begin to pray in the Spirit. I want to encourage those of you that are filled with the Holy Ghost, awaken that again. Awaken that. Make that a something that's just natural to you. And those who aren't, or maybe that you want to have more information about that, let us walk you through that. But I just want to encourage you to begin to get alone again and begin to pray. And it doesn't have to be, I, I grew up Southern Baptist where you had everybody come to the altar and then everybody tried to outpray each other for like a, good 30 minutes. You had the men that had the big thunderous voices and they would just go and go like they were calling at a cattle auction. I'm serious. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a posture of prayer that is you're driving and all of a sudden it just hits you to begin to pray for something. You begin to just, I I don't know what it is, but I I need to take this road tonight on my way home just to listen, just to pray, to get behind that curtain. Because he's wanting to deal with us in some things, some internal things. But the thing that I'm finding for my life is that when he gets me alone, he does one thing. He reassures me that I'm his child. Doesn't matter what I look like, doesn't matter what I've acted like on that day, I'm his child. And then he reassures me that, honey, this isn't all about you. There's somebody else out there that has got it a lot worse. There's somebody out there that's hurting, that's just hoping that you're thinking about them. And that's whenever the prayers begin to go up. Because I feel like, honestly, there are moments in my prayer life over the last probably five, six years, I've seen myself at times kind of stuffing the censer full of incense and just swinging it, but there's no fire. Because with fire, it comes a little bit of pain. There's just a, because I'm telling you, I, I had this conversation with a young lady the other day of whenever you have fully committed yourself over to the Lord and you fully committed yourself unto others, you're no longer your own anymore. You're now a priest. People are going to come to you. They're going to look to you. They're going to expect power in your prayers. So tonight, for us, I want the prayers that bring me to the brazen altar because I visit that altar many times whenever I'm I'm struggling, I have issues, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I need reminded at moments. But I really, really want the prayers that take me into that deeper holy place where I can begin to pray in the Spirit because my own understanding is weak. And I can begin to pray and I begin to see things change in the atmosphere with my friends and my family and the situations and and there's things that need to move forward and all of a sudden I bring my prayers to an altar of incense with the fire of God riding on them. And I see things begin to happen. I want to do this tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you all in this place know that your heart is desiring and longing a prayer life just like that. Yeah, I know I'm not the only one. A prayer life that truly gets in the deep places of God so that He can speak a word in due season for exactly what you need and then you can hear a word that not, you, not just you need, but what the world needs. I want to invite you to do something. With nobody looking around or anything like that, I want you to step out of your seat and let's come to this altar together. And just for the next few moments, just begin to pray. Whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds like, just begin to pray. Let the sweetness of God just lead you in prayer.
thank you, Jesus, for what you do. For those of you that are filled with the Spirit, I just encourage you right now, just begin to pray in the Spirit, however the Lord leads you in this moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you ignite our prayer lives. Ignite, my brothers and sisters. Set us on fire. And then take us to that place. Take us to that secret place and deal with our hearts. Deal with our minds. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. that you speak to every child of yours, Father, in the way that we can hear you clearly. No mistake. Thank you, Jesus, for what you do. tonight that we would remove ourselves so much our self-centeredness and our pride and our selfishness sometimes God and fill us God burn us and then fill us God God I pray for boldness in this room to begin to pray even simple things God Simple things we take for granted, eating by ourselves and just praying over food, just saying thank you. God, let that be a start. Give courage. Give courage in Kroger and Sheets, Speedway, 7 Eleven, to walk up to someone needing comfort and to pray. God, I pray for an aggressiveness in our prayers. That you did say ask. So when it comes time for us to begin to ask for things, give us a boldness and an aggressiveness to ask. God, because you, it's not about a persistence thing with you, God, because you're not an unjust judge. You're just judge. You said ask anything in my name. So God, I pray a boldness to come over your people. God, I pray, Lord, that you would take away any kind of pauper or poverty mindset and just give us your kingly mind. God, I pray for everyone's discernment in this room tonight. God, just like you gave discernment this week to so many that said, now wait a minute, I need to stop, take a step back, and then move forward. I pray that you heighten and set ablaze everyone's discernment in this room tonight, that they will be just like the sons of Issachar that can know and know what the signs of the times are, but also know what to do in their jobs. I pray for those that are up against situations at their jobs and in their workplace, God that they would know what to do the next time they sit down at their desk because they've been hitting their head up against a problem that they could not solve. God, 
give them the discernment to know what to do next. Thank you, Jesus. God, I pray for those tonight that are not with us. I pray for our church, God. I thank you. God, I thank you for this body. God, I thank you for the sweetness that you've blessed us with. How it's a family, it really is. But God, you've called us to so many things that only you, Lord, if you're not in them, God, we don't want to put our hand to it. And we know you're in them. God, I thank you for the vision of this house. And God, I pray that you continue to protect and guide it. But God, over the next few months, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that our prayers as they go up before you, that they would be sweet. They would not be a stench in your nostrils of how just it's all about us and we just want you to meet us and give us our permissive will. But God, I pray, Lord, it becomes so sweet to you. That everything that we rise from this house becomes so sweet. Our worship, our giving, our honor, our love, our prayer. So God, I pray right now, ignite my life. Ignite my prayer life. Ignite our leadership's prayer life, God. I thank you, Lord, for our meetings whenever we get in moments and all of a sudden somebody says, let's just pray. Thank you, God. That prayer is not a default to your people at Expression Church. It's not the last resort, but God, it is the only resort. And God, I just pray that you lead us in that. Continue to. Let it spill over, Lord, out of this building, into cars on the way home tonight, in prayers with children. And God, I pray for boldness for moms and dads tonight and husbands and wives that maybe haven't prayed together in a very long time, that they would just gather their family together, no matter how weird or awkward it might feel, and just say, let's pray together. We're going to offer up our prayers just like incense tonight. Because God, we know you hear us. We thank you. We bless you tonight, God. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You all be blessed. If you want to stay and pray, that's completely fine. We'll keep the music low, but you are dismissed this evening. We'll see you Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Be blessed. <laughs>